All right, so welcome to another edition of Millennials Are Killing Capitalism Live. Uh, today, I can't really say that I'm excited about anything right now, but these these live streams are sort of like a form of, um, to borrow from what Sina Rachmani often says, they're, they're kind of therapeutic. Um, I think they're necessary in these times, and I also hope that they provide resources for people to do political education, to make connections, and to, um, you know, clarify things as we are in struggle with each other in these difficult times. Um, obviously, as always, um, you know, our hearts and our minds are in Palestine and in Gaza right now. Um, and uh, this comrade that I'm going to bring on today, um, I can genuinely say I'm excited to talk to because they are one of my favorite um you know, just a brilliant thinker, uh, a great analyst, somebody who really thinks with, uh, you know, political economy, the history of Korea, um, the struggle for liberation for Koreans. And there's a lot of, um, I think, really interesting and dynamic um, resonances and relationships to think about with regard to uh, the Korean struggle and the Palestinian struggle. So uh, without further ado, I'm going to bring to the stage Ju Hyun Park, Hyun Park uh, who is a member of No Dot Dole by day and engagement editor at The Real News. You can follow them on Twitter. Uh, that link is in the show notes. Show notes. <laughs> um, welcome to the show. How are you doing? I'm good, Jay. Thanks for having me on. Good to be back. Thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah, we had a, if anybody is a film fan, we had a great episode, podcast episode a few years ago, uh, talking about your review of, why can't I think of the name of that movie? Um, Parasite. Parasite, right, right, right. Yeah. And so there's a lot of great discussion in that also of uh, Korea, North Korea, South Korea, um, and uh, end of that film um and so you know that's a great conversation as well um and so yeah welcome to everybody who's listening in um you know there's please like share subscribe all of that good stuff um so let's get into the discussion so you know thanks for agreeing to do this um in particular you agreed on really short notice i think i asked you like the other day <laughs> um and as folks may know or should know um you know as I already said, I'm a big fan of your writing, thinking, analysis, uh, and I've been thinking a lot lately of different ways to have conversations about Palestine that also um, deepen our analysis of the situation of Palestinians um, and expand our analysis and knowledge about other important histories and struggles, you know, for, help us connect these things, help us understand the dynamics of one situation by thinking about the dynamics of another as well. Um, and it struck me probably as a result of the work that you've done and your organization, Know That Dole, uh, have done. Um, there's a number of important resonances between Korea and Palestine. Um, so I wondered if you could start by just talking about some of the resonances you're thinking about in terms of expressions of imperialism that we have seen historically and in the present moment. Yeah, absolutely. I think there's a lot to examine when we look at Palestine and Korea together. And I think it's important actually to look at Palestine and Korea as two elements of a shared story. Or another way to look at it is as two fronts in a shared battle or a shared war. Um, even at the level of tracing the kind of timeline of colonialism and imperialism in Palestine and in Korea, we can see where there are some more obvious instances of overlap. Um, for instance, the Balfour Declaration in 1917, in which the British Empire uh, basically establishes a legal basis to uh, turn Palestine into uh, an exclusively Jewish state. Um, that roughly corresponds to the time of annexation of Korea by Japan in 1910. Of course, imperialism doesn't just like magically turn on in either of these places in those specific years. We have to go back to the 19th century to see 
how the kind of like infiltration of imperialism began decades prior to those moments of outright colonization. We also can look to the post-war period after World War II, particularly to the years, um, the five years uh, after 1945 uh, up until 1950. Uh, this is when both uh, the Nakba is taking place in Palestine and the division of Korea is being engineered by the presence of the US military government. Um, and in both of these instances, we actually see the enormous role that's played by the United Nations, which at this point is, you know, a very new body that's supposed to be replacing the prior League of Nations, but which is established uh, with a particular structure that gives the US preponderant power over the decisions uh, that can be made and the discussions that can be had uh, within the United Nations, that being the Security Council. Um, and this is, of course, you know, very consequential for both Palestine and Korea because it's the United Nations and in particular the Security Council that plays uh, a very pre uh, preponderant role in uh, the decision to kind of like establish this so-called uh, two-state idea in the case of Palestine and also in Korea to more or less establish what is a two-state idea in that there will be a North Korea and a South Korea, one Korea that is socialist, one Korea that is capitalist and therefore U.S. aligned. So I think that kind of like just gets into the basics of this timeline. And I say that, you know, we have to look at these as parts of a shared war, uh, as, you know, components of a shared struggle, because that's actually how imperialism looks at these things. It's not just a question of, you know, the U.S. being profoundly evil or profoundly greedy, you know, unable to kind of like control itself in either instance. Um, there's actually unifying strategy that goes into its approach uh, in into Palestine and Korea around this time. Um, the Secretary of State at the time, Dean Acheson, uh, referred to this as uh, the Great Crescent. It was this idea that the United States needed to uh, establish its geopolitical control and domination over this arc that would stretch all the way from the Persian Gulf and the Middle East or West Asia to, uh, the Jap to Japan uh, and the Northern Pacific. And Korea and Palestine are two very key uh, geolocations in order to establish this kind of um, this kind of hegemony over uh, the, the whole of Eurasia. Um, and you know it's the particular uh, it's the particular connection between these regions that I think even helps us understand the sort of different development paths that have been uh, been undertaken in these areas. Um, what was the purpose of intervening in Korea and keeping Korea? Uh, divided and kind of maintained uh, for U.S. control. A lot of it actually had to do with the possibility to rebuild Japan, um, with providing a market for Japanese industry after it had been destroyed by the war, uh, with creating a bulwark to prevent the spread of communism into Japan, which would then imply the loss of a major industrial center uh, for capitalism. And in order to, you know, supply that capitalism and to, you know, expand uh, that industrial base that already existed in Northeast Asia, what would be required? Oil. Uh, fossil fuels would, of course, be incredibly important to that kind of endeavor. How do you secure the global flow of this particular commodity? Um, and really all commodities. You know, it really depends on a few key choke points uh, in maritime trade around the world, including the Malacca Straits, the Panama Canal, um, and of course, the Straits of Hormuz and the Suez Canal, which, you know, enable uh, commercial entities to bypass Africa and then facilitate trade between markets in Europe um, and in Asia. Um, so we really have to like look at it from the perspective that the imperialists do to understand that you know they are approaching this with a shared strategy in the sense of you know which uh, resources do we need to control, which specific countries do we need to have a uh, very tight dominion over in order to secure a more global uh, flow of commodities that then allows for the asymmetrical accumulation of capital within the centers of empire. So I think that's kind of where I would start in terms of trying to understand where these resonances are. You know, we can talk more about um, the specifics in terms of the kinds of warfare that are deployed, um, things of that nature. But I think, you know, we need to start from that kind of macro point of view to understand that we're not talking about far flung places, even though Palestine and Korea are very distant by geography, don't share a language, don't share a culture, um, don't have like a particularly like rich history 
necessarily um, going back to like the very ancient histories that we do have in these specific places. Um, but we are bound together uh, by this common struggle that's brought about by a common oppressor that thinks in common terms. That's great. I appreciate that. Um, shout out to fecal people joining us in the chat. Um, uh, welcome, welcome, everybody. Um, and so let's talk a little bit about some of those specifics. I mean, um, you know, there's, you know, I'll, I'll let you kind of choose among these what you want to tackle. You know, there's a lot that we could talk about, obviously. Um, there is the kind of uh, context of of genocide, right, as a kind of strategy. And I, you know, people don't always, people tend to think of genocide as just like the wiping out of everybody, but it, it, it doesn't necessarily mean that. It's destroy a people in whole or in part. And it, you know, it, it has a certain, um, it's a certain way of engaging warfare, right? And it can be, there are slower genocides and there are longer ones and there are very, there are kind of like really big flashpoints, right? Where there's a, a huge amount of death and destruction. Um, so I think mean, that's that's one thing. Um, obviously, there's also the relationship of kind of client states or proxies or you know colonial outposts, right? That we might think of in terms of both Israel and South Korea. Um, and um, yeah, and then and then obviously these strategies also of like occupation and and partition which are you know part of both stories as well so from that feel free to kind of take it where you want to yeah absolutely um i think it's interesting to think about both uh genocide and partition as sort of these resonances or currents um going back to the title of this live stream uh, that exists between palestine and korea i think let's start with uh thinking through partition um, in the process of division a little bit. Uh, you know, partition is not unique to Korea, obviously. This is something that we've seen come up again and again. It's something that continues to play out um, on the world stage. We could look at Sudan in the last couple of decades as an example where, you know, this particular strategy has once again been deployed. Um, and this really goes back to the colonial tendency to, you know, find uh, native informants and allies that you can turn against uh, the population you intend to colonize and then you know use that process of uh, division of uh, pitting forces against one another to you know weaken the targeted uh, people i think you know particular to the cases of uh, palestine and korea what we see uh, after world war ii uh, in this moment of so-called decolonization when you do have uh, many former colonies beginning to kind of emerge from the shadows as their independent states in their own right is that the the particular um the particular logic of sovereignty um as it exists in you know the world we the capitalist world we know today is actually wielded against um these former or you know still currently colonial peoples in that <clears throat> you know where uh the colonized people begin to assert their own sovereignty imperialism implants uh to Borrow from Manu Karuka, who is a professor at, um, I'm forgetting the name of the college, but he has a wonderful book called Empire's Tracks um, about, you know, the U.S. railroad system and the use of uh, Asian labor in U.S. settler colonialism. Um, but he proposes this notion of counter sovereignty in that, you know, imperialist or settled colonial sovereignty is always a form of sovereignty that exists to negate the sovereignty that is expressed by the colonized people. Um, so in the case of Palestine, you know, you have uh, the indigenous multi-faith peoples of Palestine who, you know, want to be break free from the British grip, who want to, you know, like live um, according to their own independence. And, you know, in Korea, you have something very similar uh, following the defeat of Japan in World War II. Now, you know, the establishment of, you know, Israel as a state, the establishment of South Korea as a state, is really a form of you know negating that claim to sovereignty with a counterclaim, right? With saying you know like oh well you know your sovereignty is not legitimate because there's this other competing sovereignty that is based on a separate democratic will, right? And that's where you know uh, the role of international law comes in uh, in terms of legitimating those processes, even if you know uh, the exact way that plays out is not particularly legitimate, even according to the letter of the law, which is something that you know we would see. Um, 
I think you can you can argue that that was the case, you know, in both Korea during division and uh, Palestine during the Nakba. I think getting to uh, this question of uh, genocide is, you know, very much tied in uh, with these questions of sovereignty, because what is the purpose of uh, genocidal violence in either, in either of these cases? It is to eliminate the basis of, you know, this uh, the sovereignty of the colonized people, which, you know, then impedes uh, the counter sovereign claim. Uh, which would, you know, monopolize the territory, the labor of the territory for the purposes of capital. Um, and, you know, that's where we see the, that's where we see the naked, uh, completely barbaric violence unleashed, right? Um, we can look at what happened at Al Shifa Hospital last night. We can look at what uh, Israel has been doing for the last 40 days and the last 75 years, right? In the sense that, you know, they don't only target those who take up arms against uh, the Zionist entity. They target the entire Palestinian people. They target the entire capacity of the Palestinian people to exist and to reproduce themselves, uh, to live basically, right? They attack their water, they attack their crops, their olive trees. Um, they destroy the land itself in order to prevent uh, Palestinian people from being able to stay alive, right? In order to you know, uh, reproduce themselves from one generation to the next. Um, in Korea, you know, what we saw during the U.S. aerial campaign and the ground campaign was, you know, a similar logic whereby, um, and I think, you know, this is kind of where we need to, like, bring in a little bit of an understanding of guerrilla warfare, right? Uh, Mao says uh, that, you know, the guerrilla is like a fish in a pond or something to that degree, right? So then the response of imperialism is to drain the pond, uh, in other words, to destroy the people. Uh, so that the activities of the guerrilla become impossible. Um, that's something that's reflected in the Dahiya Doctrine of Israel, which is something they developed during the 2006 war in Lebanon uh, to justify their attacks against uh, civilian targets. And, you know, that's something that has resonance with U.S. counterinsurgency going back to the Indian Wars. Um, but I think, you know, in the 20th century was really developed uh, in the particular cases of Korea and Vietnam um, in the sense of uh, the Phoenix program and in um, Korea, the kinds of tactics that were deployed against the Korean people. Um, so in the case of the South, that entails uh, designating all refugees behind, uh, uh, within battle lines uh, as uh, legitimate enemy combatants who can be fired upon, who can, uh, soldiers can be given orders to bomb. This is something that happens again and again throughout the South in the early phase of the war. Uh, when the UN troops arrive in the North, uh, the order is given by the US to essentially liquidate the uh, Workers' Party of Korea, which at this point constituted something like 14% of the entire population. Um, and of course, they're using a very, very broad definition of the Workers' Party. They're talking about all the Workers' Party and all who support it. Um, so that can be construed as people who did laundry for soldiers, um, children who like, you know, helped with deliveries of supplies. Um, there really is no distinction that is drawn between a so-called combatant and a non-combatant. Um, and that's something that, you know, imperialism has done time and again in its colonial projects, right? Um, within the sphere of the civilized world, you know, the so-called like walled garden of Europe and, and North America, there is a civilian and combatant distinction. Um, and that's something that has to be upheld and respected. But outside of that, that disappears. Um, you know, all of the inhabitants of a, col of a colonized place or a place that is targeted uh, by imperialism can be construed as uh, as combatants. That's something that happened in Korea. That's something we have historically seen in Palestine, but is playing out currently. You know, that's why Israel is making these ridiculous claims that you know, oh, Hamas is hiding under all of the hospitals. Um, I don't know if you saw that video. Um, I think yesterday or two days ago, where uh, an Israeli uh, military officer was in a hospital, pointing at a calendar that just had uh, the dates of the week written on it, and claiming that it was some kind of uh, analog Hamas schedule that they were using to, you know, designate their uh, responsibilities. Um, you know, we can look at these and like think, you know, how ridiculous is all of this? But in reality, this is something that imperialism turns to time and again to, you know, justify its violence. Um, and I think it's particularly um, important to understand that, you know, this is something that has only escalated since the concept of genocide has entered international law, right? And really a lot of what 
we see in both Korea and in Palestine is attempts by the imperialist power to circumvent that law by establishing the sort of legal basis that this is in fact not genocide because these are legitimate military targets, right? The school is a legitimate military target, that hospital is a legitimate military target. And that is kind of the cutout that exists in genocide as it exists under international law that, you know, if there are attacks that are made that result in mass death, but these were done for so-called legitimate military reasons, then there is a legal basis to claim that it is not genocide. Um, I'm talking about, you know, like the specific mechanisms of the law here. I'm not talking about whether or not Israel is or isn't committing genocide because that's indisputable in my opinion. Um, but from the standpoint of how international law is actually set up in this current moment, because it is still bourgeois law, um, there is that carve out that exists. And I think that's why, you know, we see uh, the United States and Israel, you know, engaging in the kind of discourse that it does, engaging in the kind of narrative ploys that it does. It's not just about propagandizing the population. It's also about, um, you know, like from the perspective of their lawyers, covering their ass in a legal sense. Um, so that, you know, they can claim that, you know, oh, well, this wasn't really genocide because, you know, we were engaged in legitimate military activity um, because these were, in fact, not civilians, but combatants. Um, and I think that's the kind of um, resonance that, uh, that's important to establish um, because it, uh, it helps us understand how, like, this particular activity of partition, um, the patterns of mass killing all really come together under this international law framework. Yeah, appreciate that as a breakdown, you know, and I think that, yeah, it's always probably important for us to make the distinction for our listeners that, you know, to the extent that I reference genocide, you know, I'm not in necessarily um, trying to legitimate the way that international law functions around the concepts of genocide, um, but really kind of also still accepting that there is a historical process of genocide. And I think that that terminology can be useful for us in in kind of understanding the type of warfare that's that's being engaged in, even though I absolutely don't expect the United States or Israel to be held accountable for for genocide in some kind of, you know, courtroom or anything like that. I mean, they're their courtrooms. Right. Um, and um you know similarly we see these dynamics at the un right of like mm -hmm. that there's so much opposition among almost every country in the world save a few settler colonies and their allies um for what israel does just on a policy basis on a normal quotidian basis um and yet uh you know because the u.s has so much power within the un it it really doesn't mean a great deal. Um, and also because of the, the problems of sanctions and things like that, you know, and the ability of the U.S. to, to sanction countries if they, you know, take certain stances. Um, so actually in that context, I think it's actually kind of remarkable, for instance, the number of um, Latin American countries that have started to like formally break off relations with Israel, at least in this time period, um, you know, because I think that there is, uh, for all of those leaders and those countries, it does put a target on their back um, from U.S. imperialism in, in doing so. Um, Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, this is a key kind of, you know, I mean, these, these claims, these things are self-contradictory, right? Like we see the way that, you know, the U.S. is is sort of, like you say, the lawyers are sort of couching them in certain talking points around, um, you know, how do we talk about this? And yet it's it's quite clear that, I mean, even with the, the hospital last night, like one of the things that they had to make sure was to get rid of all of the journalists that were there, like to, right. to make sure that nobody could record what was actually going on in the hospital. Um, mm -hmm. You know, and I think that it's it's and that's been a I mean, you know, I, I used to kind of get somewhat frustrated. And this is as a journalist it, with like people focusing on harm done to journalists, like during protests and during, you know, it's like, well, they tear gassed everybody. They rubber bulleted everybody. Like, do I really care that the journal like is the journalist really special? 
but I think what you see, especially in this uh, in this fight, what you know becomes illuminated is that you know the purpose of attacking the journalists is so that people don't see what is actually occurring, you know. And I think that in in the context of what Israel has been doing in Gaza, you know, and in Palestine more broadly. This is quite apparent. I mean, bombing journalists, air striking them, killing their families. Um, you know, it, it's it's really quite profane, and you can kind of see the, you know, from a imperial perspective, the tactical purpose of uh, assaults on journalists. You know, um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, and I think you know when I bring up these like uh, these kinds of like qualifications and you know like details of like international law and you know uh, how genocide is defined and all these things my aim is not to say you know like oh let's not use that term or you know let's not you know like engage in like uh like formal legal contestation over what's happening right um like i think all of the un resolutions are good even if israel does not listen to them you know like there was a lawsuit that was launched by palestinians against the u.s government yesterday as well you know like these are all examples of things that I think you know have to be done because we do have to contest imperialism on every terrain. Uh, we also have to understand that you know the law as it exists is not our law, right? Um, and that's not to say that you know we give up, but rather that you know we use that understanding in order to demonstrate you know when the law does fall short, when it fails us because it is not designed for us. Um, that you know we're able to come back to that and point that out, um, not as a reason for despair, but as a reason for us to have the power to enforce our own law right uh to have the power for the law to actually reflect our interests um and you know i'm using r in the broadest sense here of you know the global working class of all colonized peoples because you know that's not the reality that we live in um but i think you know like we have to uh engage all of these struggles with a clear understanding of what is the nature of it that we're doing what's you know the history of it not so we can like back away from things or you know find reasons to not you know continue struggling but so that we can you know, essentially define our own goals within struggle. Yeah, I appreciate that. Um, so talk a little bit about the two imperial outposts in this instance, you know, the Republic of Korea, South Korea, um, and Israel. Um, you know, there is some history of mutual support from my understanding. And then there's also obviously, um, you know, some resonances in terms of the importance of these two sites for empire so yeah whatever you want to draw on there yeah absolutely i think you know we can conceive of uh palestine slash israel and south korea as essentially garrisons uh for imperialism that exist on either end of the asian continent um and i think you know you can find other examples that you can easily like slot in there to like expand our understanding i think we can look at uh, Taiwan in a very similar way. We can look at all of the U.S.'s, you know, overseas territories uh, in the Pacific in the same way. Um, the point being that, you know, like uh, going back to, you know, this notion of choke points um, is that, you know, like uh, imperialism is a system of the accumulation of capital on the global scale. Uh, it also relies on, you know, the control of like very specific uh, geographic locations in order to actually achieve that level of domination um, at the scale of the planet. And that's something that's been true uh, for centuries. When, you know, we see the origins of this kind of like mercantile capitalism in Europe um, via the Portuguese, like a key uh, part of that is their control over specific ports in Asia and Africa. Um, it's not necessarily, uh, it doesn't really begin with the annexation and control of entire countries or continents, uh, and particularly their interiors, it's actually controlled the coast. Um, and that's something that, you know, has been elaborated on by imperialism's own theorists. Um, I think, you know, uh, Mahan, uh, Alfred Thayer, I believe, Mahan of uh, the United States, who was a naval officer who developed this notion of land power and sea power, which has kind of informed the way that the United States looks at all of its uh, conflicts uh, with, you know, near peer competitors or other superpowers uh, thenceforth. Um, you know, uh, this notion was really used to like, in particular, understand, uh, what the basis of, uh, U S and British power was, which was in control over the world's waterways. Um, and, you know, that kind of maritime power, um, as opposed to 
you know, the more like territorial power, particularly of large Eurasian states, whether that was the Soviet Union, China. Um, and so, you know, I think we need to like, uh, kind of like understand that as a kind of a, a grasp of the framework that they're approaching this with. Um, now, when it comes to, you know, South Korea and Israel in particular, um, I think that, you know, uh, the observations of Kim Il-sung are actually, you know, very helpful here in that, you know, he identified uh, Israel and South Africa because, you know, South Africa was an apartheid state uh, during that time that he was speaking um, as two of the most uh, vicious uh, sort of proxies of imperialism that existed in the world uh, to that day and that were specifically designed uh, to hold down uh, the potential of African and Arab revolution. Um, and then, you know, he identified uh, Taiwan and also South Korea as, you know, fulfilling the same function uh, within East Asia, of course, with Japan at their backing as well. Um, and so, you know, like when we think about uh, what the purpose of, you know, these kinds of uh, counter-sovereign claims of, you know, establishing these states is, um, it really is to provide a geographical toehold, right? Um, which uh, provides a military advantage, right? Because the United States can arm uh, Israel to the teeth. They can arm South Korea to the teeth. Um, they can have South Korea's military under the operational wartime command of the Pentagon. Um, and then, you know, this actually greatly enhances uh, the military hegemony and position um, of the United States and its allies. And in addition to that, you know, these states are also very important for their capacities uh, in the organization of production um, in these regions as well. You know, like Israel is a huge high-tech economy whose value like greatly outstrips, you know, like uh, what would seem reasonable for the number of people that live there. Um, but, you know, it's because, you know, they have uh, all these preferential arrangements and contacts, uh, particularly with Silicon Valley um, in such a resource-rich region um, that they are able to, uh, you know, play such an outsized role economically. Um, which also, you know, like supports, you know, the overall and, uh, you know, final goal of the imperialist project, which is not just to like dominate land for the sake of domination, not just to kill people for the sake of killing, um, but ultimately to facilitate uh, the accumulation of capital and the expansion of capital into new markets, uh, which are always required um, because, you know, capitalism as a system uh, cannot continue to survive unless it is always able to continuously expand. Um, and South Korea, along with, you know, the other so-called Asian tigers, you know, played a very similar role, you know, throughout this uh, century in the sense that they became the kind of new industrial belt of the world um, for a period of about two or three decades where, you know, like a great amount of industrial production was happening there, um, which kind of like uh, enabled the emergence of like the sort of neoliberal consumer economy as it exists today. Uh, and of course, a lot of that has like, you know, transferred to China over time. Um, but, you know, all to say like, you know, there's these two sorts of aspects that we need to understand, right? There's the military and geostrategic aspect of, you know, having these outposts, but there's also um, the aspect from the standpoint of production, from the standpoint of, you know, like organizing and establishing uh, industrial uh, centers in uh, resource rich regions, whether they're uh, rich in raw materials or in labor. Um, and then, you know, like having that be a process that, you know, kind of brings those means of production under the control of imperialist financiers um, that are, you know, not going to be based in these places, but in New York and London, et cetera. And I appreciate oh, yeah, go ahead. that's kind of a large term, but we can talk more about South Korea stuff as well. But yeah. Yeah. So one thing that you said that I would love for you to just say a little bit more as you use the term counter sovereign claims for folks who wouldn't necessarily know what you mean by that could you say a little bit more about that yeah that's kind of going back to you know what i was saying earlier in the sense of like uh you know israel and south korea their existence is staked on this idea that you know they have a legitimate claim to sovereignty that is equal to or supersedes uh the sovereign claim of you know the colonized people um, in Israel, it's a little bit more clear cut because it's a settler colonial situation, right? So it's the sovereignty of the settler against the sovereignty of the native. Um, in Korea, it's a little bit different because South Korea is not a settler colonial entity. It's it is a 
a country of Korean people. Um, but you know, the the kind of like basis for uh, South Korea's existence as a republic came in 1948 um, during a UN sponsored election in Korea, which only uh, included the US occupied zone. So only half of the country is participating in this election to ostensibly establish a government for the entire Korean peninsula. Um, and to this day, uh, South Korea does officially claim sovereignty over all the Korean peninsula, as does North Korea. Um, the difference in their origins is that, you know, the basis of North Korean sovereignty was the formation of people's committees after the defeat of Japan in World War II. These were committees of popular sovereignty, self-government that existed throughout uh, the Korean peninsula. Um, in the South, they were liquidated and eliminated over a period of five years by the U.S. military. But in the North, they persisted and they formed the basis of what was what became the North Korean Revolution, uh, which began with you know the process of you know establishing a popular government uh, based on the democratic control of the People's Committees, and then engaging in a process of land reform in order to uproot the feudal relations and and the colonial relations of production that still existed in the country, um, and then so. It's only as that process is uh, taking place that you know South Korea as a country, as a you know separate independent state, is uh, then established because it's about establishing you know this counterclaim that uh, really represents the interests of um, you can say the bourgeoisie. Of course, it was quite small in Korea at the time, but you know the bourgeoisie, the landlords, the collaborationist class, and more importantly, of imperialism, right, and keeping South Korea as a base. Uh, to use against um, all of Asia and China and the Soviet Union in particular. Um, and, you know, we can look at Israel from the same standpoint. You know, it's about establishing a base uh, for military purposes and also establishing a foothold economically to ensure the control of resources and labor throughout the region. Um, so I think those are kind of uh, two of the similarities that we see there. Right on. Appreciate that. Um... So another thing that struck me, obviously, is that there are histories of solidarity between the DPRK and Palestinians. Um, mm -hmm. You know, this is not an outlier, people should know. Um, you know, the DPRK has a rather long history of support for various anti-colonial struggles over the years. Um, but I wondered if you could share a little bit of this history and some of the things that stand out to you or you find particularly interesting. Um, you know, and is it something just for folks who don't know, you know, is this still ongoing or was it more a product of the kind of, you know, so-called anti-colonial period, anti-colonial movement and the Cold War? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So to kind of establish some basics, the DPRK or North Korea does not and has never recognized the existence of the state of Israel. Um, so that's that's one. Um, secondly, there is a long history of the DPRK's moral and material support for the Palestinian resistance, but beyond that, for the broader axis of resistance as well. Uh, the PLO uh, benefited from training in the DPRK during the 1970s. George Habash, uh, founder and leader of the PFLP, uh, also spent some time in the DPRK receiving training as well. Um, during the Iran-Iraq War, uh, the DPRK supported uh, Iran militarily by pro uh, providing advisors and technicians. During the 1973 war, uh, the DPRK also provided advisors, technicians, and even fighter pilots uh, to aid Egypt and uh, Syria against Israel. Um, beyond that, you know, uh, and I have to kind of provide the caveat that, you know, after 1990, things get a little bit more fuzzy. Um, and the reason for that is because uh, while many of these countries continue to like uh, very enthusiastically proclaim their friendship with the DPRK, um, the DPRK officially denies um, pretty much any and all uh, military assistance to these countries. Um, and I'll kind of get into the reasons for that in a moment. Um, so a lot of you know what we might know about uh, more contemporary cooperation doesn't come from claims made by the DPRK or the countries it's allegedly assisting. It comes from Washington and Tel Aviv um, and also Seoul. Uh, so, you know, we have to kind of take these things with a grain of salt, I would say, um, because, you know, uh, it is these alleged relationships that are used to grease the wheels for increased sanctions, to justify military uh, attacks on targets, uh, whether they're in Syria, Iran, uh, Lebanon or elsewhere. Um, of course, because uh, the DPRK is and has been officially defined as a terrorist state. And so, you know, if you 
are engaged in any kind of exchanges of a military in nature uh, with an alleged state sponsor of terrorism, according to the U.S. State Department, then that you know provides a legal basis to uh, you know justify other kinds of action against you. Um, but some of the claims that have been made are that you know the DPRK has provided uh, military technology transfers, uh, particularly around the use of missiles. Uh, to uh, Hezbollah in Lebanon, to Iran, uh, to Syria as well. Um, there's also claims that you know Hezbollah fighters uh, trained in the DPRK uh, during the 2000s, that the DPRK sent uh, technicians and advisors to assist with the construction of tunnels uh, by Hezbollah. Um, and you know there's been you know various military analysts who have claimed that uh, missiles produced by Iran and by Syria, um, are very similar in design and build to missiles uh, created by uh, the DPRK or North Korea. Um, I have read an interesting claim uh, from one Israeli analyst who believes that uh, Iranian and North Korean uh, missile launches are timed uh, to kind of uh, coordinate with one another so that they can kind of learn from one another's uh, mistakes and experiences. Um, of course, you know, that's one allegation that, you know, I don't think is really possible to prove. And, in addition to that, of course, you know, there are claims that uh, DPRK weapons uh, have either been directly given to or just otherwise ended up in the hands of uh, both the Houthis in uh, Yemen and uh, Hamas in Palestine. Um, I'm not a military expert, so I cannot assess those claims at all. I don't know what really differentiates one kind of missile from another. Um, so, you know, I'm not going to attempt to you know engage in that. Uh, but, you know, I will at least recount that, you know, these are the claims that have been made. These are the uh, the sources of information. And, you know, there's reasons why the DPRK officially denies these things. That being said, um, if it is the case that, you know, some or all of these claims are true, uh, it implies a very important role that the DPRK has played uh, in the construction of the axis of resistance in you know, the enhancement of the axis of resistance military capacities over the last 20 or so years, uh, which have really begun to tip the scales in terms of you know, what is militarily achievable uh, against Israel and the United States in the region. Um, so I think you know, this speaks to an example of very deep um, and material solidarity uh, that has potentially gone back for, at this point, half a century. Um, and I think you know, the the sort of last thing that I would uh, I would say about all of that is that uh, it also connects very deeply with uh, the DPRK's own understanding of revolutionary theory, uh, particularly the notion of the Songun idea, or the which is usually translated into English as the military first idea, but in fact uh, is a little bit deeper than that. Um, I think those who may have some familiarity with North Korea have probably heard of this in the context of the DPRK's investments into its own military um, as a policy. But uh, Songun is also an overarching philosophy of uh, revolutionary warfare, which essentially takes as its basis that, you know, in the final analysis in all politics, force is the final determinant. And so if you are on the side of the revolutionary forces, you need to develop your capacities for military physical force if you uh, want to, you know, uh, realistically and seriously, you know, engage in any uh, kind of process that's going to result in victory. Um, so, you know, we can see how, uh, quite clearly, you know, like these, uh, this sort of support for, uh, the resistance movements, uh, you know, across the axis of resistance would very much align with this idea, right? It's not just about, you know, the Cold War considerations, not just about the fervor of the anti-colonial period. It is really like grounded in principles and, you know, ideas of revolutionary strategy, you know, how do we win? Um, how do we kind of like weaken the global imperialist enemy? And a big part of that equation is, you know, we enhance the military capacities of those who resist imperialism um, so that, you know, they can actually achieve, uh, you know, victories on the battlefield or victories in warfare. Um, and, you know, I think we can see that uh, in a way, like uh, if we look at the sorts of advances that have been made by the axis of resistance, um, that idea is being vindicated over time. Um, and yeah, I think that's just about the, the cleanest summary of it that I can provide. Um, and one last point kind of, that's a little bit random at this moment is, you know, getting back to the idea of the tunnels, the DPRK constructed many, many tunnels during the Korean War. 
uh, Korean technicians travel to Vietnam to assist in the construction of the same ones there. Um, so, you know, if this process has been repeated uh, in Lebanon um, and then, you know, transferred to Palestine via uh, Hezbollah, then that, you know, points to like a very clear like genealogy, genealogy of resistance that actually connects the resistance in Palestine to the resistance in Korea um, in a very concrete way. Thank you for that breakdown. Um, just a clarifying point. So you mentioned 1990 as a kind of um, point of departure for the the denial or the you know basically dprk no longer publicly stating that it supports these movements is this because of the fall of the soviet union i mean what is i mean obviously they're you're saying that they're now designated a state sponsor of terrorism but i'm just curious like how you analyze that specific moment yeah, I think, you know, it has a lot to do with the fall of the Soviet Union. It has a lot to do with the reversal of fortunes of the DPRK during the arduous march in the 90s, which is a period akin to the special period of Cuba. Um, you know, this is when, you know, the DPRK is having tons of problems with its food system, with, you know, its basic uh, capacity to, like, maintain itself. Um, and so, you know, this is a period also where, you know, you have global uh, uncontested unipolarity. Um, so I think, you know, uh, the support that, would have existed in the 80s, uh, dried up pretty quickly in the 1990s from the DPRK. Um, and then from that point, you know, the DPRK being the target of such, you know, a vicious campaign of lawfare or, you know, war by legal means or mechanisms, um, you know, has kind of adopted the posture of, you know, saying that, you know, it actually, you know, of denying any claims that are made, that it is, you know, providing uh, technicians or technology or weaponry of any kind. Um, you know, to any of these entities. Um, and, you know, I think we have to look at it in the context of uh, everything that's happening to understand, you know, like why exactly these things are being said, what in fact the truth may be. Although of course, taking it with the caveat that we can't actually know it right now, we probably won't for at least a few more decades. Appreciated. Um, so one of the things you and I talked about discussing was, um, you know, some comparative analysis of like revolutionary and counter revolutionary currents in these two contexts. Um, so, yeah, could you share a little bit of what you were thinking about there? I think I've kind of uh, touched on that a bit with like, you know, talking about uh, looking at uh, the potential uh, collaboration and solidarity that exists between the Axis of Resistance and the DPRK uh, as an expression of this Hongun idea. Um, and, you know, kind of uh, thinking in terms of the strategies that are deployed by imperialism in Palestine and in Korea as well, that being like partition, the use of, I would say, like irregular troops, you know, like if you look at uh, settler militias and also the kinds of fascist gangs that were used in uh, South Korea prior to the Korean War, particularly in the Jeju massacre uh, and the repression of, uh, you know, revolutionary forces in South Korea during that period. Uh, we can definitely see some resonances there. Um, and of course, you know, as we were discussing the use of, frankly, like genocidal tactics, the wholesale and indiscriminate targeting of the civilian population, you know, under the logic that, you know, they do not in fact legally constitute citizen uh, civilians uh, because, you know, they are all construed as combatants. Um, so I think those would kind of be the sort of broad themes that I would point to. Yeah. And you kind of you've alluded to this and talked about a little bit along the way. But I think also another interesting thing to some extent is like kind of the political economy of both South Korea and Israel in terms of like what's allowed in terms of parties, like positions that, you know, I mean, it, it, ostensibly these are both, you know, free democ democratic you know states is sort of the way that they're described right in the west and there's certainly some um you know kind of yeah i mean there's certain certain i guess you could call them democratic norms that are in place but at the same time um you know there's a real crushing of any kind of dissent and we still see this you know i mean in israel we're seeing a lot of this now is there are um, certain Israeli groups that are, you know, in favor of a ceasefire or in favor of a of a different strategy, and that these are actually attacked by the the IDF as well, right? As um, you know, not um, you know, whatever. I mean, I don't know how they they think about that, uh, you know, but they, but 
people, I mean, I, an example, right, would be like the, a couple of weeks ago, there were like assaults on like Orthodox, uh, you know, Jewish folks within, um, mm -hmm. I think, Jerusalem, right, that were um, being attacked by the IOF. And so, you know, there's, I don't know, I mean, obviously, South Korea, Republic of, Republic of Korea has this history also, as you've talked about, of like, kind of liquidating or just crushing um, groups that have a more socialistic bent that have them um, you know are thinking more about unification uh with the dprk and and so on i don't know if yeah i mean you've probably covered that enough but i don't know if you have anything else you want to say on that yeah i think you know when we look at israel and south korea um i think you know there are points of similarity and points of departure right um, one of the most important differences between them is that, you know, Israel represents a settler colonial invading entity, you know, that, you know, has to abide by a logic of an ethno state, right? Uh, South Korea, it's not the same. Uh, South Korea is, you know, a competing claim of uh, more or less uh, like a legitimate form of native sovereignty, although, of course, you know, because of its neo-colonial relationship, you know, that is the thing that distorts it. Um, and of course, you know, these are both, you know, outposts uh, for U.S. imperialism as part of a grander strategy, but then, you know, the underlying, you know, social basis that constitutes either of them is very different because of this difference in character. Um, but I do think, you know, the similarities that are really important to note are that, yeah, you know, like uh, they are both uh, political projects that exist to uphold a particular outcome, right? In the case of Israel, it is the gradual elimination of Palestine as an actually existing entity, right? Um, and, you know, the subjugation of the entire region to imperialism. In South Korea, um, the purpose is to uh, provide a counter uh, to, you know, uh, the North Korea, to, to North Korea, um, to maintain uh, Korea in a state of either division or, you know, eventually from you know, the preferred perspective of the most reactionary forces in Seoul and Washington to eventually bring all of Korea under, um, you know, the uh, capitalist domination and therefore under the control of the United States. Um, and so, you know, any kind of political expression that runs counter to these things is going to be incredibly criminalized, incredibly persecuted. Um, you know, in the, in the case of South Korea, you know, like there is an ongoing uh, essentially like war being waged by the federal government against unions uh, throughout the country, against, uh, you know, organizations that promote not even necessarily reunification, but even just peace, right? Um, because, you know, these are seen as a very grave political threat uh, to the, you know, preferred outcomes of uh, South Korea's bourgeoisie and uh, the United States, which is, you know, in this moment to retain South Korea in the fold of uh, U.S. alliance. Um, to, you know, prevent any kind of rapprochement with the North, to prevent any kind of, like, deepening alignment with China. Um, and, you know, in order to achieve that, that it has to entail, like, essentially the, uh, the stifling of any kind of uh, political force that can provide uh, any kind of reasonable opposition to the current reactionary government of Yun suk yeol um, I think, you know, in the case of Israel right now, um, the repression is probably far more pronounced. You know, South Korea is not actively engaged in like a campaign of elimination at the moment. Um, and so, you know, I think, you know, we are seeing, you know, much more overt measures uh, taking place uh, in Israel uh, at the moment. Um, but, you know, I think these are kinds of the, the similarities as you're pointing out in terms of their approach uh, to these things. Yeah, absolutely. Um, peace is a threat. And I that that definitely is the case in both contexts. Um, and then, uh, you know, you you made this point earlier, you know, referencing it as a garrison state. And I think that that's, you know, an important, you know, term for people to think about. Uh, um, I mean, in both cases, but there is a difference between, you know, a settler garrison pay state and a kind of neo-colonial garrison state, you know. Um, all right. Um, so the last thing I I'll ask, and then if folks have questions in the chat, feel free to, you know, drop them in there and I'll pull them up at the end. Um, you know, the last thing I think that's important to discuss is, is just this discussion of demonization or criminalization 
Um, at certain points, I think it's quite arguable, um, you know, that DPRK is the most demonized state on the planet. Um, it, you know, it may not be that way right at this moment, but um, certainly we've seen that within the last, you know, 10, you know, or so years where there are moments in which uh, that's quite clear. And it's on our news station every day telling us something, you know, uh, some form of so, it, you know, there's an amazing amount of propaganda, right, and outright fa outright falsehoods that go into this demonization. Um, we also see this on full display right now, obviously, with regards to like how Hamas and, you know, Hamas just sort of stands in, of course, for the whole of the Palestinian resistance and and how they're demonized, um, you know, and this actually expresses itself in in legal ways too, in which it, it actually legally limits um, the ways that people can be in solidarity or express support for um, either, you know, uh, you know, entity, state, group, right? Um, you know, and I want to offer a caveat, which, you know, I don't think I should have to offer, uh, but I will anyways, but it doesn't mean that we have to have some um, you know, idealized or perfect vision of what the DPRK is or what Hamas is as political organizations. Um, that's not really the the project that I think is important in kind of demystifying and debunking some of these things. Um, but the level of vilification that both are under um, does make it very difficult to to analyze, to have a kind of sober assessment, a real conversation, an adult conversation with folks. Um, and I believe, for instance, that, you know, you and, and your organization are in favor of, you know, hopefully, you know, a, a unified and democratic Korea free from imperialist control and intervention. And feel free to correct me if I'm, if that's not the correct um, way you all look at it. But, um, you know, it, this is much the same thing that many of us would would hope to have, you know, for Palestinians as well. And, um you know, obviously that's, that becomes very difficult for people to grapple with, I think, under this level of demonization. So, yeah, I don't know if you want to offer some thoughts on that. Obviously, I'm sure it's something you think about a lot with regard to the Korean context. Um, but yeah, whatever you have to offer on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I think, you know, uh, that reference you made to unification is actually really important to understanding the demonization process in either case, right? What is the goal of demonizing Hamas? What is the goal of demonizing the DPRK beyond just justifying, you know, current and future military activity uh, that's going to be uh, taken against uh, both Korea and Palestinians? Um, and I think that is to kind of foreclose the possibility of like a real political solution to either crisis, right? Um, if you begin from the basis of, you know, like the DPRK is this irredeemable evil uh, that just has to be regime changed. And that's the only way, uh, uh, you know, that we can ever have like a lasting solution to this. That's essentially creating the basis for a permanent situation of division, right? Um, an approach uh, that doesn't enshrine the idea of one Korea, but of two Koreas, right? Um, and that kind of goes back to this idea of, so of, you know, indigenous sovereignty or the sovereignty of the colonized versus the counter sovereignty of the colonizing force, right? Um, you know, it's creating this, uh, this conception that, you know, like this, this state is always justifiable. This is actually the preferred uh, way of things, even though in its very nature, it requires constant conflict. It requires, you know, like a uh, constant contradiction, right? Um, so I think, you know, that's uh, something we need to like understand about both cases um, because, you know, why vilify Hamas as a kind of essential Essentially anti-Semitic, bloodthirsty force. You know, um, it is to foreclose the possibility of a one-state solution, which would, you know, require that Jews and non-Jews live in the same society as equal members, and that there is some level of reparation for the Nakba, right? That there is a right to return, right? That you know, there isn't any kind of idea that you know there has to be a so-called uh, demographic basis as uh, Israel and Zionists uh, put it as uh, to like kind of preserve, you know, the integrity of a so-called Jewish state, right? Um, and, you know, I think, you know, if you uh, 
uh, foreclose that a uh, one state solution is possible because you buy into this idea that Hamas and Muslims are inherently anti-Semitic and that anti-Semitic anti-Semitism is this like eternal force that can never be uh, struggled against or resolved within a society. Um, then what is the only solution? The only solution is a two state solution, which uh, in my opinion, always leaves open the possibility for open warfare between these, uh, what, you know, what is, what then gets constructed as two societies always requires uh, the permanent dispossession in such to some degree of the Palestinian people from their land. Um, and also like always ensures the capacity of Zionism to retain its own armed body of men, which is what a state is, right? Its own monopoly over the use of force that can then be wielded towards, you know, whatever political outcomes are, you know, preferential for its ruling class, which is going to entail the further dispossession of the Palestinian people and the further subjugation of the Arab region overall, right? Um, so I think, you know, that's the kind of like shared um, political dimension of that demonization that we have to understand, right? It's not just about justifying the current violence, it's not just about justifying the future violence, it's about maintaining, you know, the status quo that is actually preferential to imperialism, that rather than, than there be one unified, independent, democratic and socialist Korea, uh, that there are two Koreas, right? Um, one is a capitalist dictatorship and one is socialist, right? Rather than, uh, than there be, you know, one uh, secular democratic uh, state in Palestine, um, you either have, you know, the de facto, you know, one state reality of Israel, or you have uh, this, you know, fanciful idea of a two state solution where you essentially have, you know, like two armed bodies, one of which is going to continue to be supported and upheld by imperialism and the other not. And then, you know, somehow that's going to, you know, uh, achieve like a lasting solution. And that's what we should be aiming for. And, you know, anything that does not, you know, uh, uphold or like propel that aim is something that has to be rejected, right? Um, so it's really about, you know, like controlling, like what are the boundaries of acceptable thought? Um, you know, like what are the boundaries of acceptable action and, uh, you know, realistic solutions um, to either of these crises uh, in a way way that, of course, is going to um, continue to benefit imperialist interests uh, in perpetuity. Um, I think the other element of the demonization is, you know, to really look at um, how demonization intensifies when people fight back, right? I think, you know, there's been a lot of support that's built over the last couple of decades in the West uh, for Palestine. Um, and I think a lot of people have and are continuing to have a moment of reckoning in the wake of Al-Aqsa flood, right? Where, you know, you have a lot of liberals who are like grappling uh, with their possibility of continued support because violence was used, right? Uh, because, you know, uh, Hamas, Hamas and the Palestinian resistance factions resorted to uh, armed and military means uh, to, resist this, to resist their oppression, uh, not just at the level of throwing rocks at tanks, not just at the level of, you know, a few rockets being fired, but actually at the level of like going on the offensive, right? And I think, you know, people have had to like wrestle with, well, do I support going on the offensive or not, right? And I think, you know, uh, seeing how the demonization has like escalated in that instance and also how support has wavered uh, among some segments, even though it's uh, intensified and expanded more generally, I would say, among way more people. Um, I think that tells us a lot about how these dynamics work, right? Um, it's a little bit of a cliche at this point to, you know, point these things out that, you know, um, Marxism in the West, uh, the left in the West, like tends to have a little bit more sympathy for the idea of being an underdog. Um, some have phrased it as a fetish for defeat. Um, but, you know, essentially like it goes back to, uh, how do we conceive of the military means by which, you know, revolution and liberation are achieved, right? Do we actually support those things? And if we do, then, you know, like we have to, I would say, you know, find ways to stand by and defend uh, those actions, um, you know, in their totality, you know, understanding that, of course, it's not pretty, you know, we're talking about warfare, right? Um, but, you know, we have to understand that, you know, none of this started on October 7th. Um, and, you know, None of it started on June 25th, 1950, the official date of the start date of the Korean War either, right? Because the war is in fact being waged by imperialism against us, right? Um, it's what's actually happening is that, you know, that war is being turned back on the, uh, upon the real aggressors, right? 
Um, and, you know, of course, any entity that demonstrates its capacity to really be able to return that violence is going to receive the most intense demonization possible, right? And I think, you know, that is how we have to understand the demonization of the DPRK, right? Because the DPRK developed nukes independently, right? They have one of the largest and most powerful militaries in the world. They have achieved real deterrence against the United States, right? They are under constant attack. They are under constant siege. At the same time, like the U.S. is not necessarily itching to start an all-out conflict with the DPRK because it understands that that's it's not actually something it can necessarily win, right? It wants to find means to weaken the DPRK. It wants to find means to overthrow the DPRK if possible. But I think, you know, if we, if the, if the United States really believed that, that it was capable of achieving that outcome, we would have already seen it, right? Because we saw it in Iraq, we saw it in Libya, right? We saw it everywhere else, right? Uh, where the U.S. like actually went full on and attempted to do those things. Like, why has it not done the same in Korea? I think a huge part of that explanation is because simply the conventional military capacities of the DPRK are far greater than any other kind of enemy that the United States has attempted to take on uh, this century. And, you know, like, you know, we may in the end, like, all believe in peace. We may, you know, like, want a world without that war, but we have to also understand and ground all of that within the reality of war as it, uh, as it exists in the world we really live in. So, yeah. Much appreciated. Um, and uh, I guess one thing I'll ask, um, we don't have any questions in the chat yet, but if folks want to add one, feel free. But I'll ask one thing too, since you're here. Talk a little bit about your organization and some of the work you all do and, you know, like what your, you know, what your organization advocates, et cetera. Yeah. Uh, so I'm representing Noruto for Korean Community Development, an organization founded in 1999. Uh, we're an organization of Koreans in the U.S. Uh, that oppose imperialism and that are struggling towards uh, national liberation for Korea, which entails uh, reunification and liberation from, uh, you know, U.S. imperialism. Uh, so that entails, you know, the, the occupation of Korea um, by the U.S. military. Um, we see, you know, like, uh, capitalism as a very, like, essential, uh, pillar and, comp uh, component, you know, like understanding, uh, you know, like why imperialism exists, uh, throughout the world and, you know, understanding imperialism itself as an expression of a global capitalist system. Um, in terms of like what the organization does, uh, you know, we've, we are working towards, um, organizing and mobilizing our people, right? We want to, you know, spread awareness and, you know, consciousness of the reality of Korean history, of, you know, the responsibility of Korean people to, you know, constructing a liberated future, not just for Korea, but for the entire world. Um, we do that through a variety of means, uh, through public education. Uh, we've historically organized many delegations to both North and South Korea. Um, delegations to North Korea have been foreclosed since 2017 because of the U.S. travel ban. Uh, that was initially imposed under the Trump administration and has now been upheld by the Biden administration every year since. Um, so, you know, that is one of the like uh, main targets of, uh, you know, what we're trying to change um, in order to facilitate, you know, those transfers of knowledge in order to allow for the development of people to people uh, diplomacy and connections, which we see as uh, really integral to uh, the process of, you know, building peace. Um, and, you know, we engage with and support it, uh, other organizations that are uh, engaged in campaigns to for a peace treaty to end the Korean War um, and, you know, other examples of uh, action that, you know, kind of opposes uh, the U.S. Uh, agenda within Korea itself. And uh, we're also engaged in solidarity, you know, support for anti-imperialist struggles globally. Uh, which is why, you know, we have been mobilizing Korean contingents around uh, Palestine marches taking place in the U.S., uh, why we are, you know, continuously and always looking for opportunities to expand that kind of solidarity uh, with Palestine and with, you know, uh, other um, other situations and nations as well, uh, examples being Cuba, Haiti, etc. Yeah, right on. Um, so this is a good question. Is there a good movement to reunify Korea now? Is the population in South really starting to be supportive of this idea? Or is propaganda disrupting it? Um, I know that, you know, there was some interesting aspects a few years ago, um, you know, in this with, uh, I can't remember the president at the time. Um, but yeah, just share, share 
your reflections on that in this context? Yeah. Um, I would say that reunification has always been popular in South Korea. Um, and of course, it comes in ebbs and flows. I think, you know, we have to understand that as with any progressive idea, the actual level of support for it depends a lot on like the conditions of the moment. Um, but those are things that can like change very quickly. You know, every time there has been a revolutionary upheaval in South Korea, re uh, reunification comes back on the table. That happened in 1960 when Lee Sung Man was overthrown. Uh, that happened uh, in the 1980s during the democratic movement against Chun Doo Hwan. Um, and of course, you know, it happened recently uh, during like the candlelight movement against Park Geun Hye uh, during the presidency of Moon Jae in, who was the one who was kind of brokering those uh, negotiations uh, with the North and, you know, uh, establishing uh, declarations like the Panmunjom Agree Agreement, which, you know, set a goal of officially ending the Korean War together and like building towards a reunification process. Uh, what I would say about reunification is that, you know, it is a widely held sentiment among, among many, many people. There are many, many different visions as to what it entails or how it should be achieved. Um, there's also differing levels of emphasis and priority that are placed on it by uh, different groups within South Korea, um, not just within the left, but uh, along a broader political spectrum as well. Um, so I wouldn't really define it necessarily as, you know, like there is or there isn't a reunification movement. I would say that, you know, like, there is an understand, there is understanding, contestation, discussion about reunification. It comes back on the agenda um, with, I would say, like, you know, pretty important regularity. Um, and, you know, at least among the forces of the left in South Korea, like, there is an understanding that it matters. You know, there is uh, an understanding that it is kind of like a eventual outcome that needs to be achieved. Uh, of course, you know, different groups seeing it um, on different timescales. Um, <clears throat> but, you know, to provide like some examples of, you know, like how it sort of enters uh, the politics in contemporary South Korea, um, last year during Uji Freedom Shield, which was one of the largest U.S. Uh, South Korea military exercises that took place, um, there was a joint effort made by the two largest umbrella unions in South Korea, which have some history of collaboration, but also rivalry. Uh, that's the, KC, the KCTU, which is more progressive, and the FKTU, which began as a, a yellow or government-sponsored union, but has since you know, taken more independent stances. Um, there was a joint effort made by them to actually reach out to the General uh, Federation of Trade Unions in the DPRK and put forward a joint worker statement um, in, uh, in opposition to US military exercises, you know, in opposition to the UN administration's agenda in South Korea. Um, so, you know, I think it's important to understand that, like, uh, the real question of, like, the state of, like, reunification as a concept that people do or do not support is way more complex than, you know, uh, are many people supporting it or, like, actively working towards it right now. You know, it is something that is generally always, I would say, part of the political milieu. Um, and, you know, the idea and the reality of, you know, like, working across division is something that, uh, you know, the Korean left, you know, has a lot of practice in over decades. Um, and, you know, uh, I think that's something to understand. Um, I would say that there's way more propagandization, uh, propaganda about the idea that South Koreans don't think about reunification um, than necessarily there is, you know, like successful propaganda in getting people to oppose reunification. And there are people who do oppose reunification. I need to be clear about that, right? Um, this is still like a controversial idea within South Korea. Um, but, you know, the point of the movement is not necessarily uh does like a overwhelming majority of people support a specific vision of it um so much as you know is it a factor in how like politics actually plays out and is it a factor in the way that people think about their future which i would say it is right on there's a few more questions so there i'll pull up two that are probably shorter and then we'll get to a couple other ones um so this one uh, you know, would the organization be open to starting chapters in cities outside the U.S.? And then I'll pull up one more and you can answer both. And um, then there was a question about the travel ban of like, you know, Trump had this, you know, this interesting relationship, I guess, with um, uh, why am I Kim, Kim Jong-un, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but, you know, obviously, you know, was also supporting travel ban. So, yeah, if you could respond to those two. Yeah, um, I, I really can't speak to like, you know, the plans of uh, Little in the future at this moment. Um, I think uh, 
regarding the Trump DPRK relationship, um, yeah, uh, I would say that, you know, a lot of the narrative, the popular narrative around that uh, deeply misunderstands what really occurred there. Um, we have to remember that, you know, uh, Trump began with threatening fire and fury uh, against the DPRK um, in the same way that, you know, Lindsey Graham is now going on the news talking about, you know, eliminating Palestinians. You know, he was on CNN, all these news stations saying the same thing about Korea uh, in 2017. Um, but I think what happened there is that the threat or the possibility of unilateral U.S. military action actually uh, resulted in a unity of interests uh, between elements of uh, South Korea's ruling class uh, with the DPRK in the sense of, okay, well, that's obviously something we want to avoid, right? Um, so that created a lot more political room for a possibility of peace negotiations uh, to proceed uh, between North and South Korea, which is what happened, right? And it was only after that um, that, you know, the Trump administration was kind of invited into that process, right? And the reason for that is because uh, there is an ongoing Korean War, right? The Korean War never officially concluded in a legal sense. There was no peace treaty, right? There's only an armistice. Um, the United States is a party to that armistice. And, and so if you want to like legally conclude the war, you need the U.S. to go along. Uh, the United States is also the administrating power uh, through the U.N. command of the southern side of the DMZ. So there were a lot of plans put forward in the, in the Panmunjom Declaration of 2018 uh, that would have required U.S. participation. One example being the construction of a inter-Korean railway, right, which was ultimately blocked by the U.S. military because they had the authority to say whether or not construction could take place on that little strip of land, which you know is in Korea, um, but is not directly administered by you know either Korean government. Um, so, yeah, that's kind of uh, the way that we need to understand it, right? We need to look at like you can look at what Trump says, you can look at you know what political commentators in the U.S. say, how they construe this relationship, but if you really want to like understand what happened there, just look at what the U.S. government did, right? They attended those talks. Um, they did not make any like lasting commitments outside of a brief one to like pause, uh, you know, U.S. military exercises. Um, they did not participate or cooperate in any meaningful way with the independent efforts of either Korean government to proceed with the reunification process. Um, and then when it came to the meeting in Hanoi in 2019, uh, that meeting ended early because uh, the Trump administration adopted the same posture that every other U.S. presidency had before it, which was that, you know, this is not a situation where the U.S. makes concessions to the DPRK. This is a situation where North Korea surrenders to, uh, you know, the United States. And, you know, that was kind of uh, the deal that was put on the table, right? The DPRK was told that it needed to essentially unilaterally shutter, you know, its entire nuclear program uh, without any guarantees of elimination or even reductions in sanctions, without any guarantees of normalization in relationships, without any kind of uh, security uh, you know, guarantee that's made, you know, in writing or in like a more material expression of like a withdrawal of, you know, U.S. weaponry and troops, right? Um, so if we look at it from that vantage, um, the Trump administration's relationship with the DPRK was not actually that substantially different uh, from prior administrations. You know, there was more of an opening, there was more of an opportunity for a change to happen, um, largely because of the ways that the two Korean governments responded to threats made by the U.S. in 2017. Um, but, you know, this kind of narrative that, you know, it was this sort of um, weird and serendipitous kind of meeting of eccentric personalities um, or, you know, that uh, they had like a very lovey-dovey relationship, I think, you know, really is missing the forest for the trees. So, Right on. I'm going to pull up two more questions and then we will close it out because I know that you have to get on with your day. I do as well. I appreciate all the engagement today, folks, though. Um, so this question is a good question. How does the South handle the class division and the poverty and exploiting of the poor in South Korea, but stay loyal to South Korea, Korea under the U.S.? So I guess how do they deal with this kind of con contradiction of um, you know, class division and also, um, you know, their status, I guess, as a, as a kind of client state or something like that, you know? I would say a lot of working and poor people in South Korea know the reality of the political situation. They understand that uh, South, 
most of their governments, in particular the current one, uh, really represents U.S. interests and not the interests of Koreans. Um, it's like very obvious when the UN administration does things like uh, throwing survivors of Japanese colonialism under the bus in order to facilitate uh, normalized and deepened relations with Japan. Um, it's very obvious when you know you have all of these uh, military exercises constantly taking place in Korea. At the same time, you know, like uh, South Korea is part of you know the broader capitalist, like neoliberal, globalized world order that we have today, right? So you know, I, I think there's also like substantial investment in you know promoting neoliberal ideology uh, within South Korea as well, which you know kind of serves to like blunt some of the political potential of you know like recognizing and contesting that relationship um but at the same time that relationship can't necessarily be denied so i don't know if that's like very directly or fully like responding to the question but that would kind of be uh the way that i would answer that from what i gathered yeah right on i do think actually our our conversation on parasite uh also is really interesting if folks want to go back and check out the audio of that because you do go get into some of those those dynamics of um you know colonialism also there's a lot about kind of inequality and class uh politics within that film as well so if folks want to check that out that there's a lot of context that you draw on in that discussion as well that might be helpful in answering that question um last thing that i'll pull up so recommendations articles books speeches for learning more about reunification reunification or the DPRK, uh, specifically for African Black organizers that want to join in the struggle. So, um, yeah, I don't know if you have any any thoughts on this. Yeah, I think, you know, the best way is to honestly uh, read widely, right, to kind of uh, engage in uh, the multitudes of scholarship that do exist. Um, I think where I would recommend a lot of people start is with you know, engaging in some study of the Korean War itself. Um, I do have to, you know, point out the work of Bruce Cummings because, you know, he played a very seminal role in like bringing that scholarship into uh, the English language um, as, you know, kind of like one place to start, but not necessarily where one has to end. Um, I think, you know, doing reading about uh, the U.S. role in South Korea, you know, prior to the official start of the war, uh, in particular, like Su Gyeong um Korea's Grievous War is an example that I really point to. Um, Susie Kim has an outstanding book on uh, everyday life in the North Korean Revolution from 1945 to 1950. That's the title of the book. I would also encourage engaging with uh, some of the political documents of the DPRK itself to like actually understand what their positions are. Um, I think probably the best summary of it is uh, a 1993 speech from Kim Il-sung. I think it was 93, uh, maybe slightly earlier, uh, called Let the Whole uh, uh, let the whole nation unite with, I am totally fudging the title here, y'all, I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, uh, there's there's that document, there's, you know, a five-point document that's also been put out uh, on the reunification process as well. I think, you know, engaging with those is important to understand, like, what are the actual principles um, that, you know, are being pursued uh, by the DPRK government. Uh, with regard to this question, um, I would also encourage reading the June 15th declaration, which is a declaration made between uh, Kim Jong-il and uh, the president Kim, De uh, Kim Dae-jung at the time in South Korea as well. Yeah, right on. The only other thing I would offer to that is that there's also, um, you know, within uh, Black Panther Party newspaper, uh, memoirs and literature from some Panthers, and also within study of like African anti-colonial movements, like, um, you know, you also can not necessarily to study reunification or the DPRK, but also to see the historical um, relationships that we talked about a little bit earlier, you know, with regard to uh, DPRK and, pa and Palestine, for instance, um, that these things also exist for the DPRK with a lot of uh, Black and African liberation movements, um, you know, historically. And so um, I know you and I have talked before about stuff like this when we find something and, uh, you know, reading a memoir and um, like there's um, 
I'm trying to think of whose memoir it was, but I remember talking to you at one point because one of the folks who was in the revolutionary, the League of Revolutionary Black Workers um, wrote a memoir and I'm blanking on it. I wonder if I had it here. Um, yeah. So this is this is a book by Michael Hamlin. It's called uh, "A Black Revolutionary's Life and Labor." It's not a it's not a, a huge part of the discussion, but he was a he was a veteran of the Korean War, um, and you know, like actually, this had a political impact on him of like understanding you know what he was involved in and you know fighting on behalf of empire and going home and realizing that you know basically mm -hmm. he was on the wrong side and, and needed to struggle against his own um you know against empire within the u.s and uh this is an experience that you know is shared by a number of black revolutionaries uh from the 60s and 70s that there were people that were um, obviously a lot of it, folks come back from Vietnam, but there were also people who had been veterans of the Korean war who were involved in these struggles as well. And, you know, we're able to draw out some of those connections because they could see the impact of imperialism and of colonialism. And, um, you know, this understanding of being involved in these sort of genocidal wars, uh, against other colonized people. And so, um, mm -hmm. there's a rich history there too. Yeah. Um, I this did was a find question. the name of the, the speech, sorry. It's let the entire nation unite and hasten the reunification of the country. Yep, so there it is. Yep, yeah. all right, great. Yes. All right, awesome. Um, well, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. This was super informative. And, um, you know, folks, uh, you know, connect on Twitter. That information's in the show description. And um, thank you again for for joining me today. Yeah, thanks so much, Jay, and thanks so much for everyone for tuning in.